Good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, wherever you may happen to be, and whether you're watching live or archived, and welcome to Webinar Wednesday. I was expecting to miss that up and call it Transmission Talk Tuesday, but there you go. We're off to a rolling start. Today we're talking about MA3, All Digital AM. I'm your host, Jeff Welton, and I've got a couple of uh, outstanding guests with me. As you know, I always try to find somebody smarter than me to talk. Uh, if you listen to my kids, that's usually not that big a challenge. Today we've got... Dave Colasar from WTOPWFED down in uh, Maryland, right, Dave? Uh, yes, sir. I don't know about uh, who's that then. And I, I, let's see that picture. I used that picture from last year. I think we've all aged a little in the past year or so. And we've also got uh, Mike Raid from Experies with us today. Mike, welcome. Welcome, Jeff. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Oh, always a pleasure. I like it when everybody manages to uh, get online and everything works all at the right time. So I'm just going to move a few things around so I can see stuff. Uh, folks, uh, the housekeeping part first, as you may or may not be aware, we do make these somewhat interactive. If you've got any questions, feel free to type them in. I've got the little question box over here to my left, which is why you'll see me looking that way more than this way for the bulk of the uh, discussion. Uh, also, if you're an SBE member, you get a half a credit for the uh, continuing education portion for your recertification. So under category I of the research schedule, tick off half a credit if you're watching this webinar. If you're not an SBE member, why not? I always ask. There you go. Now, on that note, we are talking about all digital AM. Um, the FCC approved it. The RNO went out, what, October 27th? Is that right, Mike? Correct. October 27th, 2020. There you go. And uh, so an interesting way to cap off a uh, interesting year, to put it bluntly. Um, but uh, the actual process goes back a long way before that. And I was involved with the original testing back in, well, the original testing, the original field testing in uh, 2014 and, and around that time frame. Um, I know, uh, Mike, you were involved with some of that as well, I think, weren't you? Yeah, so, some of it, yeah. Uh, Russ uh, Munchenk, my, uh, my colleague, was uh, was mostly in, in charge of that, but uh, uh, did do some uh, support and set up for that as well. Yeah, and uh, Dave, was uh, WWFD involved in any of that part of it or did you guys come on board later? I can't remember now. We came on board later, but the facility was actually earlier uh, because uh, Ibiquity uh, had an experimental station diplexed with our 820 AM facility in Frederick, Maryland. Um, and they uh, were broadcasting uh, MA3 uh, as tests over 10 years ago. And in fact, that is uh, how I first heard MA3, uh, being the station engineer, uh, you know, working at WTOP and with that group of stations under, under our umbrella, I was able to, to hear the uh, experimental stations test and, uh, and was quite impressed by it. Okay, good deal. Now, there is a, a little bit of a history lesson going on here. I wanted to talk about that original testing for a bit, primarily because I've heard a lot of folks talking about the uh, HD and they're like, oh yeah, this new MA3, they need to test it. And there was a lot of testing going on. As you say, Dave, with the experimental station and then we did the uh, field testing for, oh, that went off for the better part of two years, I wanna say. Um, the big thing is as of the end of last year, there about a third of the stations out there for radio are AM, and that's down a little bit. It was 31% a couple of years ago, but uh, it's still a significant percentage. So it makes sense if we can do stuff to improve the quality of this, then uh, you know there, there seemed to be some benefit. The downside, of course, is that all digital is uh, not receivable on analog only radios. And I mean, in the US, that was one of the biggest drawbacks with uh, DRM because uh, that uh, that was that was just the situation we ran into with uh, with DRM which they wanted a system where it uh, could be heard on existing radios. Um, now receiver penetration was required and, and that's come along quite a ways, hasn't it? Like uh, the receiver penetration is way up there now. Yeah, it, it depends on uh, market to market. Um, 
you know, in in the DC metro area, uh, we are we are very 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 close. We are at twenty nine point eight percent of market penetration. So we're almost at you know thirty percent. Uh, if you go to market uh, market like New York City, we are at almost forty percent, and Miami, we just went over forty percent uh, last month. So we're close to closing in on one one of every two cars in Miami having a, uh, an HD radio. Okay, good. So it, it is moving forward. Um, there has been a lot of testing done. As I said, we'll uh, cover a little bit of the testing that was done. There's been a lot of manufacturers involved in there. And I mean, you know, some of them will recognize them. They're not doing as much anymore. Uh, I'm hearing a bit of echo on the audio. Dave, can I get you to try muting for a second? We might have to get you to flip over to your speakers to see if, uh, yep, because uh, your, your speakers are uh, coming through and uh, feeding back through the mic. So if you flip to your earbuds, that might be the better way to work it. Uh, we did do a quick test before, but I don't think we did it with anybody talking over top of Dave. So it was a bigger challenge then. Um, all right, so moving forward, the big thing to think about here is what we had, what we went to, and where we ended up. And um, we had the uh, the uh, analog signal originally, of course, had about a 10, or 10 kilohertz bandwidth nominally. And that uh, that was, was good as far as it went. It, it's not bad. Uh, most receivers, to be brutally honest, don't go out. Uh, Mike, I know you've done a lot more work with receivers. What's the typical roll-off for an analog receiver? A uh, typical roll-off we find to be, uh, it, 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 it obviously, it, it depends on uh, OEM. But I think probably the average is about four kilohertz. Um, right. So, so, so in an in an effort to to reduce driver distraction, um, you know, they keep narrowing the the IFs uh, uh, of these radios because of the noise factor. Simply, the the noise factors, but obviously that affects audio quality. Um, I mean, an a analog AM station can sound really good if it's stretched out, but um, and if the array is working just fine, but um, uh, you know, some of the early testing we did with a hybrid, we notoriously used older 1990s Chrysler radios because those were probably the widest IF, mm -hmm. uh, about eight about eight kilohertz or so. But today they're typically about four. Yeah, and I mean, you can still get some of the old Sonys that are that go out there quite a ways. Uh, and I remember back in the day listening on a uh, Delta AM stereo monitor to a, to an AM stereo you know. station running the full 10. Yeah, and, yeah, or yeah, an AM stereo monitor, uh, the Motorola, the Deltas, yeah, those those sounded pretty good. GE, the old GE Super Radios, you know. Um, mm -hmm. You know, now I'm starting to date myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, and uh, I made the comment earlier in the practice session that uh, yeah, Mike's been doing this forever. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, apologies for that. But yeah, the, <laughs> the big challenge though with that uh, with analog is is you don't have any data. There's no artist. There's no song title. There's none of the stuff that folks have gotten used to. And, and I know that I, I've listened to uh, to to Jeff and Donna do uh, Detweiler do their presentations. And one of the things they talk about is the fact that whether it's uh, Sirius XM satellite radio, whether it's FM radio, whether it's internet radio, there's a lot of digital like data content that we don't historically have with AM. Um, so that was kind of one of the things that drove this, if I'm not mistaken. Is that about right for uh, from the user aspect, Dave? I think so. I. I... I think in this day and age, um, the listener just expects metadata. And uh, the, the, the beautiful thing about the uh, MA3 system, as opposed to even the hybrid system, is that it allows for visual metadata as well. So you can transmit uh, album art and station logos uh, in addition to um, uh, artist title and album. Um, that and uh, you actually do get stereo audio with uh, with uh, with the MA3 mode. Um, you know, uh, most analog AM is not stereo. Uh, most receivers aren't. So you know, there's a there, there's a clear advantage. But yeah, the the, the, the metadata is a huge part of it. Mm -hmm. Oh, got a 
question already from John Van Milligan out in uh, Colorado. And uh, Mike, this would probably go to you. Uh, he's wondering if there are any uh, home receivers. I know for, for a while there were a lot of tabletops and it seems to be more mobile than anything these days. Um, you know, we found, uh, uh, we, th this is a, a kind of a delicate subject, but you know, mo most of the listening in North America is done in the vehicle. Um, and you know, our focus has, has been where people are going to buy the most radios. You know, when, when we were at Biquity and we were, uh, at the helm of, uh, by Bob Struble, um, Bob would always famously say that, you know, people, people aren't buying radios anymore. They're buying things with radios in them. Um, and there are tabletop radios available, uh, albeit there's not as many as a lot of people would say. Um, but, you know, it's, it's, people aren't running to Best Buy anymore to buy a radio specific or an alarm clock with an AM FM radio in it. Um, so, you know, it's a market, it's, it, it's, 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 it's unfortunately, it's market driven. I'm not yeah. saying they're not out there. Uh, Sanjin has a lot of tabletop products. Uh, they have yep. several, three or four products that are very good. Uh, also, our Spark product via Amazon, uh, uh, and that's S-P-A-R-C. Um, so you can either go to spark.com or you can go right to Amazon and buy the ITR radio, um, which is uh, this stands for International Tabletop Radio. So it does, you know, 200 uh, 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 kilohertz spacing or one kilohertz or you know 75 microseconds 50 microsecond uh pre-emphasis or de-emphasis in, in the receiver's case um so so uh and though and those itr radios do artist experience as well so i mean they are truly an alarm am fm clock mm -hmm, mm -hmm. so looking at the original analog as I say, we had the 10 kilohertz bandwidth, then we went to hybrid mode. Um, and this is the part where we can all grimace if we choose to, but uh, we went out to 15 kilohertz. And uh, of course the, the challenge became nighttime when uh, second adjacents sort of started tripping on each other, even first adjacents. I mean, it, uh, I, AM really goes a long way at night. So this, this was kind of a challenge, wasn't it, uh, Dave? I mean, that's, that's, and you guys didn't really do a whole lot of hybrid, did you? You just basically went analog to all the way digital. No, we, we, yeah, yeah. We went, we went straight to, uh, to MA3 from analog. Um, the, the hybrid mode, I'm not sure that our antenna system would have ever have passed it. Um, um, but also to hybrid, um it it's to put it politely it's a compromise yeah. at best and it doesn't serve either analog or digital well right um, and so. and that's one of the things i've uh i've said and you brought up antenna system and uh mike had mentioned it before too and uh that is one of the huge things and I, I mean, I wrote a, an article on this for the SBE Signal last month. So if you've got a copy of that, you, I've mentioned it in there too. But the antenna system is crucial. And to be brutally honest, the antenna system was always crucial. We've just ignored it for about 50 years. Um, I mean, it, it goes back to it goes back to what we were talking about, at, at, you know, IF reduction, uh, bandwidth reduction in, in receivers. Um, so people could neglect the antenna a little bit more. Uh, if you really wanted it to sound good and, and AM stereo, uh, you had to have a broad, flat, um, you know, a frequency response out of your antenna. If you were not doing that, if you were just broadcasting in mono and just going the will of the way of, you know, four kilohertz IFs, uh, it really didn't matter much. Uh, you know, mm -hmm. when we did the measurements for WWFD, you know, uh, we knew it was going to be bad, but we didn't realize how bad it really was. I mean, that was <laughs> it was two, it was two point seven to one on the lower side, was it not, Dave? It was a ten kilohertz out, or it, it was really bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Uh, I I I I think that um, if if you were to try to to pass any sort of digital on how the antenna system was when we started, the the transmitter would probably just trip off. 
Yeah, and I, I like to do a comparison. I did two installs uh, about two months apart, around about 2006 or so. Um, both MA1, both five kilowatt day timers, um, both directional arrays. And one of them, the uh, when you put a network analyzer on it and swept plus or minus 15 kilohertz, you had to use times 10 magnification to see anything more than a dot. It was that flat. Mm -hmm. I mean, this, this thing, my father had an expression for how flat it was, but let's just say it was really flat. Mm -hmm. uh, on that one, when you started driving the main lobe with the HD, like running hybrid mode, when the HD dropped out, the analog was already totally unintelligible. It was gone. I mean, it just, the HD outperformed. Now, the other one, and that was uh, that was a four tower uh, dog leg for what it's worth. The other one was a six tower parallelogram with a really ugly pattern. Um, Ron Rackley, rest his soul, said that uh, I can make this do HD. We'll just take that tower down. We'll move that tower over there about 100 feet. And we'll put two more towers over there. Piece of cake, million dollars, you'll have HD. Um, they opted not to do that. Uh, their sideband SWR at plus 15 kilohertz was 6.9 to 1. At minus 15 was a little better. It was 5.3 to 1, give or take. Um, that one, they had to buy a 10 kilowatt transmitter to make the five kilowatt analog power because the sideband reflected was so high. <clears throat> and it radiated HD better in the dummy load than it did in the antenna system. Um, you couldn't pick up the HD at all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. You probably lost it after a couple of miles, yeah. Oh, no, you lost it after a couple of hundred feet. Oh. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, they, they didn't cover their, they didn't cover the uh, the antenna field. I mean, it was just, that is the difference the antenna system makes. And the, the analogy I use is, except for the frequency range, we're dealing with a stereo system. And I can have the best Harman Kardon receiver and Macintosh amplifier and all the bells and whistles. And if I'm running it into a $10 set of Walmart speakers, it's going to sound like crap. And, you know, radio's the same way. And with digital, the antenna system means how far it goes, how well the receivers lock on, among other things. And with analog, it's sound quality. Uh, now, Dave, you, you look like you, you got a thought to add there. Yeah, and I, I should also say that um, there are probably a lot of AM antenna systems out there that could be tuned up correctly, but aren't right now. Um, a lot of AM systems uh, have suffered neglect over the years, and people have just cranked on the dials until the transmitter would come up, and and then it's like, okay, we're on the air, and that's that. And uh, I, I have to confess that WWFD uh, fell into that category, and uh, and uh, uh, once we uh, got the antenna system tuned up, and we did, we had to do some some further modifications, but there, there are a lot of systems out there that if you just properly tune them, they'll work. Mm -hmm. No, I mean, obviously the, the less complex the antenna is, the easier it is to bring in. You know, if you've got a, a broadband unipole single or non-D, it shouldn't mm -hmm. be that big a challenge, assuming that, uh, you know, assuming your shunt's in the right place, et cetera, and so on. So yeah, we're always... working, yeah, we're working with a, a station right now. Um, uh, can't tell you who I think you already know because you've probably seen the order but um, we're working with a single sticker that's a folded unipole uh, however even though there's a folded unipole they still need some broadening because it is an L network so uh, and it's going to need some phase shifting so so in order to get a phase, proper phase shift you're going to have to convert from an L to to a T network because the L network only does 90 degree phase shift and that's it it's fixed right and I mean, to be brutally honest, the, the L network is is a good way to do a, a cheap and dirty match, but it, it's not ideal for several reasons, not the least of which is bandwidth. It, it's good um, It's good to get you to 50J0, but that's about it. Yep. So when we moved to MA3, we went back to the 10 kilohertz bandwidth. And, and I'll quantify that because you can run core mode with uh, just the primary carriers and stick within a 5 kilohertz bandwidth. So it gives you a lot of options that you didn't have with um, with the hybrid signal where you were sticking way out into the into the first adjacents. 
Oh, um, Dave, I'm gonna jump on you a little bit for this one, but uh, you're in a fairly RF dense market with uh, with WWFD. So, uh, how do you guys uh, how do you guys see like adjacent channel and uh, second adjacent interference? Is it uh, is it an issue? You know, it really hasn't been an issue with us. We have a uh, an adjacent channel. I don't know, maybe about 50 or 60 miles away, and uh, we don't we don't step on them at all. Um, um, the and we're running the core and enhanced mode, um, so we're, we're we're using the full uh, 20 kilohertz um, allocation. Um, if we were running in hybrid mode, we probably would have would have a major problem. Um, yeah, yeah, but. With with uh, with MA3, we're uh, we, we're able to pull in our uh, spectrum tight enough that we're not bothering our next door neighbors within the normal allocation scheme. Right, and and I should add that I see a couple of things on this slide that I well one thing that I definitely should have tweaked because uh, currently requires experimental authority for the FCC as of last fall. That's uh, not an issue anymore. Uh, this is what happens when I try to modify an older slide deck and don't do nearly as much proofreading as I should. Um, question here, and Mike, I'm going to throw you in the hot seat for a second. Uh -huh. uh, apologies in advance. Will the MA3 system work with radio DNS, and will MA3 be compatible with the new receiver technologies from BMW and GM? And I've, I've got a new GM, but I wasn't aware of any new receiver technology, so... Um, yeah, it, it 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 will work with the uh, radio DNS. Um, I can't comment too much on radio DNS because with the DTS connected radio system, uh, technically we're competitors. Uh, but it would but it will it will work with radio DNS. Um, as far as the new re receivers coming out. Uh, the new technology, the Conrad receivers, yes, it, it will. So long, once again, um, it, 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 we do certify receivers. Every receiver that, that's ever made comes through our doors and is certified. Uh, one of the things we do test for is MA3. Uh, there is one receiver known to man, and that is the single DIN Kenwood uh, aftermarket radios. It's a, a, When I mean single DIN, it's it's single singular form uh, that goes in a car that was made with the early Sci, Sci Labs chip, uh, Silicon Laboratories, uh, we call it Sci Labs, um, that did not have the AM libraries installed. That, that affected about 5,000 receivers. Uh, we, we did waive it because Sci Labs was an early partner and we wanted to get them on board. Uh, other than that, yes, any ADHD receiver that gets MA1 will get MA3. Um, if it's HD and it receives HD on AM, yes, you'll you'll get MA3. You you most certainly will. All right. Especially. Well, moving forward just a little bit, uh, and uh, John's uh, so John Van Milligan's asked if we can any possibility, and uh, this is going to, and I'm just going to jot a note, John, on this, but he's asking about possibility or advantage of increasing the the power on secondary carriers, and let's hold that thought for uh, for the future talk near the end of the session because uh, there there's a few things that we want to address, and that would be one of them. Uh, the original testing that we did do, and, and there's the experimental one that you were talking about, Dave. There was a whole boatload of sites. They they tried to hit. And, and this was NA, NAB Labs put this together because I, I spent a lot of time with David Lair at uh, several of these sites. But uh, the goal was to try and hit every class to hit the various power levels and all the antenna configurations that, that could be con conceived. And uh, so like I say, over the course of a couple of years, there was a, a lot of time spent uh, standing under towers and lightning storms and uh, slugging through muddy fields, um, among other things. But, uh, why so many tests? Well, because there were a whole lot of uh, of stations and a whole lot of uh, permutations and possibilities. And remember, this comes back to what we were talking about with the antenna systems, where you know the the difference between a single stick unipole and a multi tower array can be fairly significant with respect to bandwidth and uh, complexity. So 
they tried to uh, they tried to hit all the possibilities. Now, one of the things that uh, they also discovered was that the um, the coverage was uh, pretty reasonable. And I'm going to kind of flick through these pretty quick because they're let's say it's a history lesson. It, it's more to set the background that this testing was done. Um, a lot of it was done with stock uh, stock receivers. Uh, it was pretty much all uh, Ford rental cars because at the time you could uh, rent a Ford and have a pretty good uh, chance that you'd be able to get a HD receiver in one at Enterprise. Yeah, and, and that, uh, that's going back to 2014, the Ford Sync, which is the older technology. Yeah. They're using a, a different technology now, but mm -hmm. uh, you, you, you can show show that any OEM receiver. We'll, we'll, we'll get MA3, as you saw by the picture in the previous slide. Yeah, That's and I mean, basically, I, I was the guy standing at the uh, transmitter site and somebody would call me on the cell phone and say, flip it to MA3, and I'd press a couple of buttons, and then five minutes later, they'd call back and say, flip it to MA1, and a couple more buttons, and then five minutes later, flip it to analog, and it was just, that that was uh, eight-hour shifts of uh, standing there just pressing buttons. It's uh, what I do best these days. Um, but again, it was all done with uh, stock receivers, stock antennas. Uh, I'm pretty sure the folks at Enterprise had seen us ripping off door panels and wiring and monitoring equipment. They might have had something to say about it, but uh, you know, as long as it all gets put back at the end of the day, it's all good. Um, so there was a lot of field testing. There was a lot of uh, lab testing. These all say underway. They're all well in the past now. Um, one of the ones we did, and, and Greg Borgen uh, is uh, he. he just passed away about a month or two ago, right before Christmas. But uh, but uh, his site was one of the ones, and that's the one when I talk about standing there at a in uh, lightning storms, just standing under those three towers watching storms roll by. It's uh, not my happy place to be during a lightning storm, guys. Uh, more credit to the folks that do that for a living. And then uh, yeah, like you said uh, earlier, Mike Russ was there, and uh, and a whole bunch. Of, of course, I got to take the picture because you don't want me on the other side of the camera if you can avoid <laughs> it. Oh, one of the things we did discover, though, and this was intriguing, was uh, the coverage between uh, MA1 and MA3, and that's why I brought this up because uh, with Greg's stations, he's in uh, Hudson, Wisconsin. He's about four miles east of the uh, the river in uh, Wisconsin, away from Minneapolis, St. Paul. And if you look at the 494, 694 Beltway, his coverage, he got the eastern half of it, but the western half in MA1 in hybrid mode was uh, marginal to say the least. And in MA3, it was a big difference. And, and Dave, this is something that, uh, uh, and I, again, I know you haven't done MA1, but relative to the analog, your MA3 testing has been fairly promising, is it not? Yeah, I would say that our MA3 coverage is better than our analog coverage was. Um, we, uh, the full MA3 mode, the core and enhanced carriers in the daytime, uh, reliably carry out to the half millivolt contour. And uh, the core carriers under ideal circumstances, um, you know, low noise floor, not during critical hours, uh, can be decoded all the way out to the station's 0.1 millivolt contour. Um, and if anybody's tried to get an analog signal in the 0.1 millivolt contour, you know, it's a signal only a DXer can love. <laughs> And uh, that's kind of what and the funny thing is that I've got a friend who's an engineer in uh, just, uh, well, probably a ways north of you. I think he's up in uh, Pennsylvania somewhere, I think. And uh, he's uh, picked up WWFD quite a few times in, in that neck of the woods on a car radio. So that's uh, that's saying something. That's that's pretty cool. Um and that was one of the things that uh, I say with DGY, we've, and again, this is different code going back five years. We were still impressed with the MA3 coverage then. Now, Mike, what's changed in the, uh -huh. uh, in the procedure since then? Uh, I mean, as, as far as uh, code in, in, on the transmission system or? Well, just in general, is there anything significantly different? I'm, I'm just kind of curious. Yeah, not, on the, not on the transmission system. The transmission system is we haven't really we haven't really touched it. Uh, and when we went to the Gen 4 platform, 
going from the Gen 2 platform, we really literally just uh, took the code that was in the in the Gen 2 and, and moved it over to Gen 4. Um, uh, we really haven't had to make any any modifications to it. I mean, this is the transmission system goes all the way back to the old Zetron days um, when Zetron was bought up by Westinghouse, and you know this was all Project Acorn. Um, Mm-hmm. You know, long before even USADR and Ubiquity. Uh, so, you know, uh, I mean, you know, and, and, you know, the, the method that we're using 64 QAM, I mean, quadrature amplitude modulation has been around forever. Um, yep. It's very mature technology. Uh, on the receiver side, you know, we've made a few tweaks here and there, probably regarding blend decision, uh, i.e. when we tell the receiver to let it go. Um, so not, I mean, MA3 on the transmission side is, is very robust, but also on the receiver, we, because it is all digital, it doesn't have an analog to fall back on. We tell the receiver to hang on to it for as long as we can before we feel that there may be some irregularities in the receiver. Right. And, uh, uh, Neil Ardman's in the audience and, uh, WMGG just put up an MA3 system in Florida fairly recently. And, and he mentioned that they, uh, carry to the 0.5 millivolt contour quite well in MA3. So, uh, and then that, uh, goes along with what we were seeing with, uh, with the WDGY testing. I mean, they were covering places in MA3 that they couldn't reach at all in hybrid and, uh, barely, well, again, a, signal that only a DXer would love in uh, in analog. I'm going to be using that line, Dave, just so you know. Uh, <laughs> sure. You didn't copyright it or anything, did you? Good, nope, good. you can have it. <laughs> now, looking at the high-tech picture of the, the oscilloscope, one of the other challenges has been uh, power measurement. And during the, um, the comment period for MA3, that was one of the things we mentioned that uh, how we measure power is a little different when you've got a whole bunch of carriers throughout the entire bandwidth versus a central carrier with audio over it. Uh, uh, either one of you want to take a, a stab at addressing that? Well, the easiest thing is uh, to use a thermocouple RF ammeter because it's just worked on the heater resistor. So you take the, the sum of all the carriers um, and you read the meter and uh, there's your value. Yeah, yeah, what's old is new again, right? Yeah. yeah, and uh, I, I've got a picture here that uh, any of the um, chronologically challenged folks in the audience may appreciate. We'll uh, we'll get to that in a couple of slides. Right, just to, just to, as I mentioned, and it's it is a little bit of a problem, and it's it needs does need to be addressed um, because if you're using a, a sample, you know, a toroidal sample, uh, you know, say you know the most common one obviously is the delta. Um, it's going to measure low because you're measuring peak power, not average power. Um, right. So, so it is going to measure a lot lower. Now, the, the average power for WWFD is 4.3 kilowatts. That's what it's licensed for. Uh, but as you know, Jeff, in a Nautel transmitter, the the peak power can you can see in an NX5 peaks at about mm. 28 kilowatts. You have yeah. to have an amplifier that either either has the headroom or has the crest factor reduction that, that Nautel has in, in their NX series. And uh, that's something that you guys uh, did a, a paper on that for NEB last year, mm-hmm. and we're going to get to that in a couple of seconds too, because there was some really uh, other interesting things that you came up there. Um, the, so the thermocouple is one thing. The other challenge is that... Um, mass clearance gets to be a little more when you when you bring the digital carriers up of course the intermodulation between them becomes a, a bigger issue so uh the pre-distortion uh tends to become a bigger bigger issue now with the early testing we just fired it up and let it run because we were trying to give as much an apples to oranges as we could but there is a lot that you can do with the uh, settings in the X Gen. Uh, Dave, did you find that when you guys uh, went MA3, was there a lot of uh, tweaking involved to uh, get it to line up? Uh, we 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 did do some tweaking. Um, I think you have to keep in mind that um, you know our 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 main transmitter uh, it's it's an NX5 and. Um, we would run it into the dummy load and it would make the NRSC5 mask no problem. But as soon as we put it in the uh, in the antenna, we'd we'd get a little bit of spectral regrowth that went just above the uh, the NRSC5 mask, and that's because of the uh, 
the 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 high uh, reflected power off the side lobes uh, off the off the side uh, in, in the bandwidth. Uh, you know that you know it's just your your, your antenna system is not 50 J zero. You know from DC to daylight like a dummy look. <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, so, uh, but we weren't too concerned about that because the FCC didn't approve NRSC5, didn't adopt the NRSC5 as an emission standard. So what's legal is you still have to make the NRSC2 mask. And the NRSC2 mask, you know, the transmitter is way underneath that. So uh, you can exceed the NRSC5 uh, by a bit, but you still have plenty of room in terms of what's actually legal. Right. And either or, it comes back to what we were talking about before. Definitely, from a performance perspective, the better you can optimize the both the oh, phase absolutely. rotation and the mm -hmm. bandwidth, the happier life will be, um, both in terms of coverage and, uh, and receiver acquisition, as far as that goes. Right. Yeah. You can you can see the correlation between how clean you can get your spectrum uh, yep. or how clean the 64 quam carriers are. Uh, and then that will translate into a uh, better acquisition time on the radio. And yeah, you, you've got coverage. a slide in there. Yeah, you've got a slide later later on that shows the constellation pattern. That's that's where it correlates, and we'll discuss it then. Yeah, because that's where it really, really shines. Yeah. You really see what's going on. And so I, I mentioned earlier that uh, for some of the, well, and, and you said it yourself, uh, everything old is new again. That's right. Um, <laughs> but uh, the old Simpson thermocouples, uh, this may be the time to start uh, digging through the, the uh, flea markets and the, the ham, uh, ham fest. Ham fest. To, uh, see, see if you can come up with those. Uh, so uh, Mike, in a nutshell, how does a thermocouple work? A thermocouple, like Dave alluded to earlier, just simply a, a thermocouple is just heating up a resistor so if you give it time oh you know basically give it like uh 30 seconds before you give a good average reading so that you know it has time to heat up and and smooth out and um it, it then you know with heating you know the, the heating up the resistor you know there, there, there's 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 now uh there, there's a voltage drop across there so you know the meter is just measuring measuring the current across that resistor and it's that's simply how it works it's it's really very simple um you know the the other way to the other two ways to to, to measure power are with a spectrum analyzer like you just showed in there but doing a channel power measurement um you know and measuring the channel power in in the in the 20 kilohertz bandwidth uh will will give you a power measurement so if you measure if you measure your channel power in quite simply just measure your channel power in analog and that's that's going to be your 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 base number your reference, um, yeah. your reference and then you turn on turn that off and turn on the ma3 you want the ma3 to match that same channel power anything above obviously your over your over license power anything below you need to you need to increase the power coming out of the the, the rig uh the, the most fancy way to do it is with an hp power meter which we have here in the lab um which by the way is this is the probe for it and it is a thermocouple probe so it's just simply a thermocouple resistor so mm -hmm. you could either spend five hundred dollars on this probe plus a thousand for the meter or you could spend ten dollars at the local ham fest and buy yourself a thermocouple ammeter yeah now th there's one question that uh i i I guess I, I've encountered it once, and I, I hadn't really thought about it much. But uh, with um, with MA3, we're not going to be um, able to uh, employ MDCL, for example, because you you have very constant carrier levels. So there's oh, no shift. There's yeah. So yep, Jeff, uh, Mr. Dinsmore out, out in the uh, South Carolina asked about that. So uh, yep, no MDCL, but. Uh, the other thing to think about too is that you've also got the potential. Somebody had asked earlier about increasing the uh, the secondaries. Uh -huh. um, you could almost decrease the primaries a little, or, or your overall power, and still get similar coverage. Yeah, you can. Um, and one of the things we want to test for next year, uh, this coming spring and summer, 
uh, if we can free up some time from the de uh, development team. And one is to bring up the secondary power to, to increase that coverage beyond the, the half millivolt. Uh, the second thing we wanna do is how much can we reduce that reference carrier that sits in the center? There, there is an unmodulated center reference carrier um, and, and uh, the core carriers are 12 dB below that. And then uh, the secondary carriers and tertiary carriers are 15 dB below that. Um, we can't eliminate that unmodulated carrier because that carrier is used once again as a reference for the other digital carriers to properly form. If we were to reduce it too much, uh, you'll start seeing a, a smearing of the uh, uh, constellation pattern. Well, once again, we'll get to that. We'll get that in a little bit. Uh, yeah, right there. But what, what you would see in a constellation pattern, instead of seeing all these fuzzy dots, you would see an, a, a, like an X, where the dots form an X, because those carriers, as they farther go out, are more mis, misaligned um, by not having enough reference. But one of the things we are toying about is how much can we reduce that unmodulated carry? Because one, there's no information, obviously, it's unmodulated, but it is carrying 30% of the total power. Mm -hmm. So uh, we could increase efficiency and possibly bring up core or secondary tertiary carriers at an expense to that reference carrier. Yeah, you can't you can't reduce it too much because then otherwise you see that's what the receiver relies on for coherent right. protection. Right. What you're seeing with this constellation pattern, the receiver is is desperately relying on that constellation pattern. Right. And this kind of segues us into the, the paper that you guys did at uh, NAB last year. And Dave, uh, I think this was uh, this slide was one you explained to me not too long ago. <laughs> and uh, actually in words that I could understand, which was just beautiful. But uh, what are we looking at here? Uh, we're looking at two different transmitters uh, with two different PDM rates, uh, the pulse duration modulation, modulator. Um, uh, it's, it's uh, think of it like a, it's, it's a sampler. So if, you, if, if, you have, if your sample rate is not, uh, if your sample rate in your transmitter is not fast enough, you're gonna have aliasing. And uh, that's what you're seeing on the left. Uh, on the right, your PDM rate is fast enough, and uh, so as a result, all the carriers can form nice and clean because uh, you know you're uh, you know you're above the Nyquist rate. Um, and so uh, as a result, uh, if you were to have any, if you were going to get any utility out of the transmitter on the left, uh, you may as well just turn your uh, secondary and tertiary carriers off, which are the carriers uh, on the bottom. Uh, and and this transmitter would be a core only transmitter. You're wasting power at that point, yeah. Right. Yeah. And that is one of the critical points that I try to make every time I talk about this is like, like the one on the right, I don't mind saying that's one of our NX transmitters. Um, but uh, definitely different transmitters will react to this or handle this in different ways. So talk to your manufacturer, Find out, number one, if you can do MA3 at all, because a lot of transmitters, you look at our ND series, for example, they the, the older ones will just, they wouldn't do well with MA3. So, uh, you know, other manufacturers, talk to them, ask what they can do. Um, beyond that, you know, if they say it can be upgraded and do MA3, make sure that they're including enhanced mode with the secondary carriers that Dave's referred to because the secondary carriers that uh, gives you an extra 20 kilobits of information. Is that right? Yep. Yep. So you get, you get 20 mono and stereo. Yeah. You get, you get 20 kilobits on the primary and an extra 20 with the secondary and tertiary carriers. Um, and, and also with the, uh, uh, the, 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 the middle row is, are the PIDs carriers. They are the carriers among other things that tell the receiver whether or not you're uh, transmitting in MA3 mode. Um, so uh, for instance, with the transmitter on the right, with the NX uh, transmitter, um, the PIDs carriers are well formed. So a receiver would lock onto those carriers and uh, they would see, oh, it's MA3, let me start spitting out audio right away. So within a second, you you get within, audio. Oh, yeah, within, one within frame. One. 
Yeah, within one um, audio frame, which is 1.48 seconds, yes. Right, so you, you have fast acquisition. Uh, the, the carriers on the left are trashed. So as a result, it takes the receiver longer to figure out that it's an MA3 signal. And so you can wait five, six, seven, eight seconds for it to lock. Um, yeah. So there's... Three to five audio frames, right. Yeah. And, and in an audio or in a hybrid system or an, well, an a, a hybrid system, of course, it's not that big an issue because you're in analog while it's waiting to lock on to HD. In an MA3, you don't have the analog component. So somebody flicks to your station and if they haven't heard anything in three to five seconds, odds are they're going to be reaching for the switch. So it, it's mm -hmm. something to, else, again, a lot of things to be aware of. Oh, it, 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 you know, one of the things is we've made, uh, people have made comments that they've tuned to, uh, 820, and they just think it's static, and they tuned off because they thought the station was off the air. Mm -hmm. right. it just so, right. so when we got these PIDs carriers working, we got the full MA3 working, um, all of a sudden, we got a lot more casual listeners. So as soon as we got the core and enhanced mode working with fast acquisition, uh, the station actually started showing up in the ratings. Yeah, and you hadn't shown in the ratings before, even as analog, had you? Uh, yeah, the station had not been in the ratings for about 10 years. So, so the receivers apparently are out there. That's a good sign. Well, now, true. And, and I'll, I'll say I'll say at this point that, you know, we're at about 30% in our market uh, that, that have an HD radio. And that's a higher percentage than the market that would listen to analog AM. So I'd rather take my chances with that 30% than the 100% of people who can get an analog signal but would refuse to because of quality. Yeah. And, and that's another good point, though, is depending on your market. Uh, I mean, talk to the folks. I know Xbury has really good data on receiver penetration in just about every market, rated and unrated. So, you know, you can reach out and find out, like if they can tell you, oh, no, only 15% of the cars in your market have uh, HD receivers, then, you know, it, it can help you make your decision. So uh, definitely use the information. I did have somebody ask me about the Constellation. So what you're looking at, and, and one of you guys can yell at me, raise your hand or throw something at the screen if I get too far off track. But you're basically looking at a graphical representation of the MER, the modulation error ratio, which is the difference between where the where a carrier should fall in the constellation and where it actually does fall. So in that mythical perfect world, these would all be just a, a little grid of dots where every carrier hit exactly where it's supposed to be. Um, and so what you're looking at is the error or how far they are from that ideal point. And the one on the left, they're a little farther away than the one on the right, as an example. Um, how'd I do? That perfect. My... Um, perfect. Yeah, yeah, just... what, what you're seeing at the top is, uh, on both left and right, is the 64 QAM. So you have 64 carriers that need to fall, like you said, exactly where they need to fall and, and predict it so that the receiver can properly decode them. And there's a, you know, there's a little quadrant for each one, a little box. And if they fall within that quadrant, that's great. Some may, you may have flyers that go out. Um, that's what you said is the modulation error ratio. Uh, down, down below is, it's a little different because those are 16 QAM. Those are the PIDs carriers. Uh, so they're using a slightly different scheme where the 64 QAM is quadrature phase shift, uh, the 16 QAM is, is a binary phase shift. So it's either a zero or a one, whereas the quadrature is zero, one, one, zero. Uh, so um, you need a lot of different decisions there. Uh, but like you said, in a perfect world, it would look like those 16 down there, very tight, well-formed patterns, you know, very yeah. right where the carriers are supposed to fall every single time. Yeah, the funnier it is, the worse it is. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and it should be added that this is impacted by a bunch of things. I mean, it's uh, crest factor reduction, it's uh, PDM sample rates, it's uh, the actual load the transmitter seeing. Yeah, it's your antenna the system. Of the amplifier itself. Uh, there are a whole bunch of factors that come into this. So, uh, the, and yeah, the, the, definitely you've heard us beat the drum on the antenna system. <laughs> <laughs> right. Um, the, 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 this is really a measurement of inner symbol interference in the digital transmission. Yeah. So this is where we get to mix our computers with our uh, RF. Uh, 
what you know uh, jim dalkey asked and this would be a question for you dave uh what what should he budget for transmitter efficiency for him with ma3 versus analog any significant difference in the power bill uh no difference whatsoever um uh we had folks from the fcc uh uh actually uh ping us uh when they were in during the rulemaking process and asked us whether or not uh, our power bills had changed uh once we flipped to ma3 so i was a little nervous asking our accountant you know because the second you put something on the accountant's radar then uh, <laughs> Um, but to, to, to my shock, our, our, our accounting department came back and said, nope, no change in the power bill. So, uh, yeah. Uh, cool. Now, if, if you were running MDCL, obviously it would be the equivalent of had you, you would turn off your MDCL and that would be your power bill. Right. Yeah. And so that, uh, and now, now were you using MDCL on your analog signal? You weren't originally, were you? No, it's a 4.3 kilowatt station and it's not worth it. Yeah. So that uh, Marco had asked uh, and you'd addressed it, but uh, yeah, you, so the, basically if you were using MDCL, like you say, it'd be the equivalent of turning it off because effectively that's what you'd be doing. It's if there's no carrier deviation, then you're, you're not going to uh, see any benefit from the MDCL. Uh, this is what we were talking about with the uh, sample rate. And one of the reasons, and is, I'm going to do a little sales plug. I try to avoid the little sales plugs, but hey, it's my show, so here we go. Um, but uh, with the uh, sample circuitry on the um, on the NX, we're sampling at 1.8 mega samples per second. So. Uh, you know, there's a, a really accurate representation and, and you don't have as much of a, an issue as you would with a uh, lower PDM frequency. So um, that uh, that was, and that's just something that, you know, even over our XR series, the J1000s uh, previous to that, where we used 160 kilohertz PDM frequency, it's uh, it's a big difference. And, and that was something that you guys have both discovered uh, fairly early on. Uh, while we're in this, because it is an audio circuit, uh, Nicholas has asked, how important is audio processing to the mix and do the new offerings from Omni and Orban help with MA3 transmission? Dave, that's and, all uh, you. Audio yeah. processing is very important. Um, what you are, what you should be processing your audio for, imagine a 40, kilo, a 40 kilobit per second AAC stream. Imagine processing for that. So you don't want to process it like you would analog AM. Um, you know, there's no asymmetry here. You're 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 processing it like you would a low bit rate internet codec. And um, um, once you do that, um, you know, you can get some quite impressive results. Uh, one of the things that we did when we when we uh, uh, we're, we're using uh, uh, an Omnia 7 processor on, on our on WWFD, and uh, we found that uh, the built-in HD presets for it were too aggressive because they were designed for hybrid. So they assumed that you wanted to uh, have an, as, a sound as aggressive as your analog AF. So the first thing we did was back it off, um, and uh, once we did that. Um, you know, it, it 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 sounds it sounds quite incredible. Uh, I've, I I I don't think I've ever heard a AM didn't sound this good when AM sounded good. So. <laughs> and there there is a, a lot of bandwidth to play with, and uh, it is decent. And the the one thing that that I do see with the newer processor offerings more than anything is they do lend themselves well to, to streaming and low bitrate audio, which is really, and I mean, for FM subcarriers, I've told folks over and over, you know, for your secondary channels on FM, use a streaming processor. Don't use yeah. a conventional mm -hmm. FM processor. You know, use something that's got the perceptual coding for low bitrate audio. It'll, it'll make a huge, huge difference. Um, now, I, I had to geek out a little bit. We show the schematic because we can. 
but uh, there's not a whole lot to it. I mean, you've got uh, three modulators running your uh, sample in, you run through a filter to strip off all the digital sampling and uh, end up with your analog audio, or in this case, your, your digital audio. And that becomes the power supply for an H-bridge amplifier. There's not a whole lot to these things. And the good thing is, the simpler you keep it, the easier it is to keep it more linear or to correct for that in the exciter stage. And that comes back to, that was one of the other things you'd mentioned earlier was the pre-correction makes a difference and crest factor reduction as well. But Mike, uh, can you speak to that a little bit? Because I know crest factor reduction is, it, it, more than anything, it's the, the difference between four kilowatts and uh, 16 kilowatts because of yeah. the power. Yeah, yeah. Without crest factor reduction, you're going to need a headroom. You're going to need headroom in your amplifier. Uh, you're going to need a, about 9.8 dB of headroom. Uh, that's that's a lot. Now, with crest factor reduction, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, but I think Phil said with the crest factor 8.2. That doesn't sound like, but it's almost 3 dB. So yeah, that's it's, it's close a significant to five, improvement. Five point eight or six something. Yeah. Yeah, so, so 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 you know if, if you're if if you're being able to crush factor reduction more, more than two dB, almost three dB, that's a huge difference, a major difference in, in head in, as far as needing headroom in an amplifier. If the, the amplifier doesn't have enough headroom for the for the peak power, it's yeah. just you're you're going to wind up with one of those constellation patterns on the left. Yeah, you're going to create air symbol interference. That, right. that that's right. Yeah. Yeah. Now, one other thing, and uh, this one, Dave, this will come back to you uh, because I know I don't have any. Uh, do you guys uh, have any audio recordings uh, that uh, folks could uh, access online or anywhere to hear the final product? <laughs> you know, every time we've tried to post something, we run into copyright because we're a music format. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. The, 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 I'm going to say these days, YouTube jumps all over that stuff. So uh, yeah, definitely um, best way to hear it is to, to end up somewhere where there is actually a signal to listen to or, or certainly put one up yourself. Um, we're running near the top of the hour and I don't wanna keep you guys too terribly late. So uh, quick, uh, quick glance at the output filter, just because again, the two pole T network, it's, it's a pretty basic circuit, but this and the antenna system between the two of them make the difference between whether it goes to the 0.1 millivolt contour or whether it goes to the one or whether it goes to the end of the parking lot. So uh, again, beat the drum on the antenna system. Uh, by all means, put the works into that. Um, Should be the first thing you do before you even buy the transmitter. Yes. Yeah. Oh yeah, no, sweep the antenna system because like I said, with the one uh, that I was talking about with the six tower, for them to get a decent HD signal would have been close to a million dollar investment. Now they're the one extreme that uh, we all try not to be, but it's better to know that before you drop 50 or $60,000 on new gear and discover it's not going anywhere. Um, let's see, picture on MER metering, That's uh, we've already discussed that quite a bit. Uh, here we go, we're looking at uh, your coverage. Now you said that uh, you're getting it out to the 0.1 millivolt on occasion in some directions? Uh, yeah, yeah. Now this was with a receiver. Uh, uh, this was with your test receiver, Mike, right? I mean, yeah, that's this is with a, a, an XP value uh, eval board uh, for uh, and the NXP 3560 chip. Um, and you can see all the way up to uh, the northern run, next to, uh, all the way to Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, which is 60 miles plus. Um, and you know, in, in, er in certain areas, you could get it to the point one, most reliably to the point two, uh, two five. Um, but you know, the important one is the southeastern run, uh, that goes all the way to the beltway. That's uh, that, that it failed all the way down towards Indian Head, Maryland. If you're familiar, it's it's like uh, uh, 45 50 miles away. Uh, I can get it at the naval base in Indian Head, which is 65 miles away. Um, and what I didn't, what I should have done is demonstrated the Capital Beltway, the 495. Uh, you can get coverage uh, of WWFD all the way around the 495, which means that you're encompassing Washington, D.C. 
WWFD would never ever meant to to cover Washington DC or DC Metro. And you can still get it in core only, which is parametric stereo. It still sounds really good and it's reliable. It doesn't ever drop out anywhere on the beltway. Yeah, and and my and you know it really oftentimes things depend. You know your 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 results may vary. Like for instance, my uh, stock Subaru radio does better than this map. Um, yeah. So yeah. there there there's a southwest leg uh, down there that goes towards West Virginia, and it failed at at about the point three five. Uh, the reason it failed at the point three five is you can see with the map there we're talking about two mountain ranges in between WWFD and we're talking about soil conductivity that is just absolutely very poor, very right. There's no soil, no water. It's just nothing but granite. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So, and keep it in mind too, like, uh, like Dave said, uh, so just like on the transmit end, on the receiver end, the antenna, the one receiver to another will be totally different results. So, uh, your mileage may vary. Now, the one thing we haven't touched on, HD2 on MA3. Um, so this is a screen on uh, the test receiver where, where you guys did some uh, messing around with it at uh, WWFD. Uh, what are your thoughts on it, Mike? Is it going to be a thing? It's going to be a thing. Uh, there, I, I can't speak in future terms, but the, the, the code is already there in, in chips. It's just if you're familiar with you know any sort of computer programming it's it's literally commented out in the receiver chip um so it's it's certainly a thing it's certainly we're going to submit results as part of our experimental uh, or as part as hubbard's experimental authority uh the fcc we have to submit a report technical report to the commission every year to get a renewal for the experimental uh so we plan on doing very actively testing hd2 this spring and what we'll do is we'll put a tone, a, a, a subaudible tone in a stereo program. So you'll have corn enhanced and we'll, we'll, we'll put it in one of the, one of the stereo channels. Um, and then you drive it until it fails, until it stops sensing that tone. And it's, just, it's basically what you were doing in uh, 2014 with, with Russ. Russ developed that, that, that testing tool. That's why you had to rip the door panels off because you were sensing the audio off of one channel. Yeah. So, so we have to do the same thing here. And we, what we aim to prove is, once it fails, we get it. We jump out of the. We pull over. We jump out of the car, and we use an FIM forty one hundred, and we measure. We measure the field intensity, and mm -hmm. hopefully, it, it's reading below 0. 0.5. <laughs> now, <laughs> question on uh, on the multicast. Uh, right now, there are none of the conventional re HD receivers that'll pick up HD1 or HD1 like MA3, they don't get a, um, the HD2 at the moment, correct? Correct. And odds are probably won't. Probably never will, but future receivers, you know, hopefully will 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 have this enabled. We are Right. We are we are telling the receiver manufacturers this is coming. So okay. I, I I can tell you that. Cool. And yeah, that was, uh, and basically at the moment, I mean, and, and Dave, this is uh, something where, where you were there, you sort of, I, and again, I know we're talking about blue sky stuff that, that doesn't really exist yet, but uh, what do you see as the application for, for running an HD2? I think most people are going to want to run, uh, use it to feed a translator. Um, <laughs> I mean, let's be honest. <laughs> um, um it, it if, if 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 you're uh if you're a mom and pop station with uh with an with a couple fm translators you can split your programming yeah. um um i personally for a music station i i i would like to to use the full bandwidth for the primary channel uh mm -hmm. Uh, but but on the other hand, if you're a talk station, now you can uh, you can uh, have more offerings. Um, so uh, and and it should be said that the HD2 will have the range of the of the secondary and tertiary carriers. It won't carry out uh, uh, to the beyond the 0.5. But yeah. chances are it covers but it covers better than a 250 watt FM translator. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And that's that's a good thing to note too. So there you go. That's uh, 
it in a nutshell. So the, the big things to ask, talk to your manufacturer, see if you can do core mode, enhanced mode, both neither. Definitely the bandwidth. Look at the antenna system. This is critical. PDM frequency is less an issue if you talk to the manufacturer because they should be able to tell you whether you can do core or enhanced and uh, interference should be less a problem. Um, so Dave, any closing notes on your thought or on your yeah. side? I, I think I, I just want to touch upon because you'll probably get some comments about this or some questions about this nighttime coverage. Um, have a consultant draw up what's called the uh, the half NIF contour for your station. Uh, uh, stations that get some protected nighttime ground wave uh, have something, it's a calculation called the nighttime interference contour. For WWFD, for example, that's 10.8 millivolts per meter. So we've found that no matter what happens with uh, skywave um, interference, our coverage never pulls in closer than the 5.4 millivolt or half of our NIF contour. So that is sort of your metric of um, uh, marketable coverage. Uh, at night under MA3. Very good. Um, Mike, anything closing that you uh, can think of to add? Um, I would say uh, on the Xperi side, we, you know, one of the things I hear most online is, you know, well, why do we have to use the HD radio standard? Uh, DRM is free, it's open, it's open sourced. Uh, and, you know, that seems to be much more uh, for experimental. Um, I, I would say it, it's not free. Um, there, there are some things you have to understand with DRM, uh, but right now, currently, uh, for the next several for the next several months, if not for the rest of the year, certainly, if not even further, uh, we're normal fee for uh, AM digital uh, licensing is seventy five hundred dollars. We're waiving that. There, there, there is no fee. It's zero. Uh, yeah, and, that, and and if you get that license and get it signed, um, that license is good in perpetuity. We're not going to come back for you later and 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 beat on your door for more money. <laughs> you got you got the license. That's it. We signed it. It's a signed deal. Yeah. Uh, and the one thing uh, I was uh, listening to an interview with Donna Detweiler a little while ago, and uh, she mentioned that uh, at least until June. So I would say it's know, even further than that. Uh, that uh, I did. I did. Because you you had you had alluded to me offline that you know uh, you, I'm I'm going to ping you on it. Uh, I I got some clarification on that. It's 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 several months is what I was told. Good good. So definitely if if you're considering HD or if you're even really not considering HD, it it makes perfect sense to get the license in place now. Well, um, if you're going to consider you know. it, say three years down the road. Right. Get right. it now while exactly. it's free. Yep, exactly. So um, that's uh, very good points there, folks. I've been handling the uh, questions as we got, so I don't have anything stacked up to that to handle. We're sitting right uh, just shy of ten minutes over time, which you know for me is uh, pretty respectable. Usually I'm twenty or thirty minutes late. Uh, this will be archived. You can uh, get to it uh, through the webinars link on our webpage. Uh, we have a YouTube channel. You see all this stuff there as well. So uh, by all means, you know, feel free to, to reach out. Um, and uh, if you ask a question that I can't answer, well, I've got both Dave and Mike's emails, so uh, I know where to find the answers. That's uh, what I told somebody. I don't need to know the answers. I just need to know where to find them. Yep. So on that note, I want to thank you all very much. Dave Kolasar, thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you. And Mike Raid, it was a, truly a pleasure to have you again. Thank you. Yep. Well, glad to be here. Thank you very much for taking the time out of your day to spend with us, and we hope to see you soon. Have a great day.